main character is a young man named Adam who lives in my hometown in Salisbury, North Carolina. It's a small town, about 30,000 people. 10, 15 miles outside of town, there's a 1,500-acre farm that has been in his family forever, since the 1700s. He always wanted to, to stay on the farm, run the farm. It's a multi-million dollar operation. But five years ago, uh, he was accused of murder. Uh, a young man was killed on the farm, and the only witness against him was his stepmother, who claims that she saw him covered in blood on the night in question. So he's brought to trial. He is tried and very narrowly acquitted. Everybody thinks he got away with murder, so he's basically hounded out of town. For five years, he's gone to New York. Nobody knows where he is, what he's been doing. The book opens when he comes home, and nobody knows why. Well, what we eventually learn is that his only friend from childhood called him three weeks ago and asked him to come home. Shortly after he arrives, uh, bodies start turning up. Someone dear to him is beaten within an inch of her life. Um, eventually, the body of the old friend that called him turns up dead on the farm. Okay. So things are just falling apart all around this guy. Okay, he's he's back. Everybody thinks he's killing more people. Uh, this is I'm going to start at page 246. I'm going to read a few pages and then skip ahead to sort of finish off this this scene. He is looking for the father of his friend who has been found dead on the property. This is a mean old bastard named Zebulon Faith, who when this guy came back to town at the beginning of the book. Zeb Faith and his buddies kicked the snot out of this guy. I mean, they just beat him within an inch. He's found out where he thinks Zeb Faith is hiding. He's, it's a long story, but he found some bookies in Charlotte that know where this guy's hideaway is. Uh, so the first little bit I'm going to read is when he goes out to discover the location of the hideaway. When he doesn't find Zeb Faith there, he goes back to the story, back to his life. That night, uh, the vineyard, which is a big part of his family's operation, is burned. And he is confused and in doubt whether or not it's actually Zeb Faith or his brother. Okay, you haven't met his brother yet, but his brother is a big steroid pumping, hard drinking, gambling guy who swears he has nothing to do with it. But after the fire, he says, basically, you and I are going to go out to this place I found and we're going to find Zeb Faith together. We're going to settle this once and for all. If it was you, if it was him. We're going to sell it tonight, okay? So the first little thing I'm going to read is when he finally he finds the little hideaway, which is uh, out, out of ways. Um, when he got the directions for this place, he got from some bookies in Charlotte that described um, the hidey hole as a shitbox skinny, <laughs> which uh, some of you may recognize just uh, from popular usage. The address for Zeb Faith's shipbox skinny was two counties over in an area bedridden by two decades of a failed blue-collar economy. A hundred years ago, it was some of the most productive farmland in the state. Now it was wild and overgrown, littered with shutter plants, crumbled down mill houses, and single-wise on dirt tracks. Fields lay fallow, and the forest pushed out scrub. Chimneys rose from piled debris, kudzu slung long arms over phone lines as if to pull them down. That's where Faith's hideaway was, deep in the ruined green. It took two hours to find it. I stopped three times for directions, and the closer I got, the more the countryside seemed to sweat poverty and despair. The road twisted. Single lane and cracked, it slipped between low hills and thick-smelling bogs, ended in a two-mile loop that wrapped the edges of a dead-end hollow with more cold shade than most. I was 40 miles from Salisbury, one of the richest towns in the state, less than 60 from the silver towers of Charlotte, and I could have been in a different country. Goats stood hock deep in wire pens full of shit. Chicken coops settled on bare dirt yards in front of houses with plastic bag windows and unpainted plywood siding. Cars bled rust. Flat-sided dogs lolled in the shade while barefoot kids tempted fleas and worms with blank-eyed disregard. In all my life, I'd never seen anything like it. Black or white, it didn't matter. The drain emptied here. The hollow was a mile across, maybe two dozen shacks, some by the road, others no more than mildewed hints behind hooked brambles and trees that waged stiff-armed war for precious light. The road was a loop through hell. I followed it until it spit me out at the beginning. Then I started again, more slowly, and felt eyes in the dark places behind torn screens. I heard a door slam, saw a milk-eyed woman with a dead rabbit, and drove on, looking for a number. I rounded a bend and found a little boy with skin so black it was purple. He had no shirt, a round belly, and a sharp stick in one hand. Beside him, a dusty brown girl in a faded yellow print pushed a doll on a tire swing. They stared at my car with lowered lids and slack parted lips. I slowed to a stop and a giant woman avalanched through the tar paper door. She had thick rolled ankles and was clearly naked beneath a parchment dress devoid of shape or color. 
In one hand, she held a wooden spoon, dripping sauce as red as uncooked meat. She scooped the little boy under one arm and raised the spoon as if she might flick sauce at me. Her eyes were tucked into deep flesh. You get on out of here, she said. Don't you be bothering these children. Ma'am, I said, I don't intend to bother anybody. I'm looking for number 79. Maybe you can help me. She thought about it, eyelids puckered, lips pushed together. The boy still hung from her arm, bent at the waist, arms and legs dangling straight down. Numbers don't mean much around here, she finally said. Who are you looking for? Zebulon Faith. Her head rolled on the stump of her neck. Name don't mean a thing. White guy, 60s, thin. Nope, she started to turn away. His son has red hair, mid-twenties, big guy. She pivoted on one foot, lowered the boy by a wrist. He picked up his stick and stole the doll off the tire swing. The girl raised an arm and cried muddy tears. That red one, she said, pure trouble. Trouble? Drinking? Howling at the moon? Got a ten-foot pile of shot-up bottles back there. What you want him for? He's dead. I'm looking for his father. It did not answer her question, but seemed to satisfy her. She sucked on a gap in her teeth and pointed up the road. Round that bend, you'll see a track off to the right. Got a pie plate nailed to a tree. That's what you want. Thanks, I said. Just stay away from these children. He snatched the doll from the boy and handed it back to the little girl, who smeared tears with her forearm, kissed the plastic face, and smoothed her small hands over plugs of ragged vinyl hair. All right, now that's him finding the shipbox skin. Now... He goes back to the farm, there's the fire, he gets into a fight with his brother, he's convinced that it's down to his brother, or Zebulon Faith, that's responsible. One thing I should mention, um, one of the reasons this guy is such a mess is that um, when he was eight years old, so 20 years ago, he saw his mother uh, blow her own head off, okay? So he's got a lot of issues. Anyway, this is uh, after the fire, he's got his brother, and they're going out to find Zebulon Faith. A sallow dawn threatened the dead-end hollow by the time we parked under the shot-up pie plate. Four hours had passed since I sat up, smelling smoke. Then the fire trucks, my father's helpless rage, and the battle to save what remained of the vineyard. They dropped a line into the Yadkin and used its mud-choked water to extinguish the flames. That was the, that was the one good thing, the proximity of limitless water. Otherwise, the whole thing would have burned. Everything. We got out of there before the cops came. I took Jamie by the arm and pulled him into the darkness. Nobody saw us go. Jamie was hard-faced and sullen, his skin the color of ash. Crusted blood made a sharp ridge over his left eye, and finger-wide streaks of red smeared his face. We'd barely spoken, but the important words still hung between us, and would do so until this thing was over, until we found Zebulon Faith and settled things once and for all. He got in the car when I pointed, opened his mouth when I stopped at Dolph's, and came out with a 12-gauge and a box of shells. Once, ten minutes out, he said, You're wrong about me. I cut my eyes right and knew my voice was brutal. We'll see, I said. Now, knee-deep in bent grass at the end of the civilized world, Jamie looked scared. His hand spread on the top of my car, and he watched me crack the barrel and shove in two thick red shells. What is this place, he asked, and I knew what he saw. The gray light was unforgiving, and the road in was a hard, fast slide to the bottom rung of the human experience. Just a place, I said. He looked around. Ass end of nowhere. I breathed in the stagnant water smell. Not everybody was born lucky. You preaching at me now? Faith, Faith has a trailer just around that bend. If I'm wrong about you, I'll apologize, and I'll, mean, and I'll mean it. Meantime, let's just do this. He came around the car. What's the plan? I closed the gun with a metallic click. No plan, I said, and started walking. He fell in behind me, stiff-legged and clumsy. We came to the bend, the granite shoulder cold and damp under my fingers. We couldn't see it yet, but dawn bulged on some far horizon. Birds trilled from the deep woods, and color rose in the earth as the cold gray began to die. I rounded the corner, and the low drone of the diesel generator rolled over me. Lights burned in the trailer, weak yellow and a television flicker. A mud-stained jeep was parked near the front door. Jamie stumbled behind me, nodded once, and I sidled up to the back of the jeep. Gasoline cans lined the floor behind the front seats. I pointed with my chin, made sure that Jamie <laughs> saw them. He raised his eyebrows as if to say, I told you so, but I wasn't sold yet. Could be diesel for the generator. Metal slipped across my hip as I moved. Dried mud crumbled to rubble and fell in the grass. I laid my hand on the hood and found that it still held some engine heat. Jamie felt it, too. I nodded and pointed to the front porch. We crossed the last of the clearing and knelt beneath the windows. Jamie was eager and started for the steps. I stopped him, remembering how the wood had sagged. We had almost 500 pounds between the two of us, and I did not want the porch to collapse. Slowly, I whispered. I went first, stock of the gun against my hip, twin barrels angled in front of me. A night sweat slicked the steps. 
the generator put a vibration into the structure so that it thrummed at a cellular level. Russ scaled the siding next to my face. From inside came a dull and rhythmic thump that felt wrong. It was too regular, too hollow. The gambling is my problem, he said. Oops, hang on. Skip the page. The door stood open a crack. I was getting ready to say, damn, that happened fast. <laughs> the door stood open a crack. The screen door closed behind it. Up close, the thumping sound grew louder. I thought that if I put my hand on the wall, I'd probably feel it. We knelt beside the door. I stood, looked in the window. Zebulon Faith was sprawled across the floor, his back propping against one of the decomposing chairs. Mud darkened his jeans, shoes in a corner. A burn on his forearm glowed with cherry heat. His left hand held a near-empty bottle of vodka stuffed with lime wedges. He raised it, wrapped his lips around the neck, and swallowed three huge slugs, choking. Thin tears pushed out from under tight, squeezed lids, and he slammed the bottle back down. He opened his mouth and shook his head. The television stained the room with a twilight zone flicker. The gun was in his right hand, a black, thick-barreled revolver, probably the same one he tried to kill me with at the river. The fingers held it loosely until he shook off the vodka chug and opened his eyes. Then the fingers closed, and he started pounding the butt of the pistol against the trailer floor. Up and down, lift and slam, once every five seconds, the thumping sound, wood and metal on a sagging floor. The room looked the same, trash, strewn paper, the overwhelming sense of neglect and decay. Faith fit right in, vomit stained the front of his shirt. He stopped pounding the gun on the floor, looked at it, tilted it, and then began tapping it against his head. He smoothed it over his cheek, a look of sensual awareness captured in the lines of his open mouth. Then he struck harder against the temple, strong enough to twist his head sideways. He chugged more vodka and lifted the gun, stared into the muzzle, and then in a most disturbing manner reached out a tongue to taste it. I ducked down. He's alone, Jamie whispered, whispered, and fucked up. Stay behind me. I got my feet under me, clicked the safety off the 12, and went through the door smooth and fast. He didn't even notice. One second I was on the porch, and then I was on the vinyl floor of his kitchen, maybe 10 feet between us. I had the gun up, and he was still oblivious. I watched the revolver. His eyes were wrinkled shut, the television pure snow. Jamie crowded in behind me. The trailer shifted under his weight, and Faith opened his eyes. The gun didn't move. I stepped forward into the side, squaring up my line of fire. He smiled the most hateful smile I'd ever seen, like I didn't know a smile could be. The hate filled him up, then drained away. In its place rose a deep, liquid hopelessness like I'd seen only once before. And the gun began to rise. Don't, I said. He hesitated, took a last mighty suck on the vodka bottle. Then his eyes glazed as if he was already gone. I leaned into the stock, fingers so tight on the trigger I felt it creak. But deep down, I knew. The gun came up, straight and smooth and unstoppable. The hard round mouth settled against the bellow of flesh beneath the old man's chin. Don't, I said again, but not very loudly. He pulled the trigger, painted the ceiling with red mist. Sound crashed through the tight space and Jamie staggered back, collapsed into a kitchen chair. He was in shock, mouth open, eyes wide and dilated. Why'd you wait, he finally asked, voice uneven. He could have shot us. I propped the shotgun against the wall, looked down on the crumpled ruin of a man I'd known for most of my life. No, I said. He couldn't have. Jamie stared. I've never seen so much blood. I took my eyes off Faith, looked hard at my brother. I have, I said, and walked outside. I did not enjoy that at all. <laughs> no. no. I don't know. It doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm.